Hi, I'm John David Ebert, and I'll be teaching this course on contemporary art uh, over the, it'll take about two months, so it'll unfold over eight weeks. Um, and what I want to do, my background is uh, I've written about eight books. I'm a cultural critic, and I've written uh, eight books, including The New Media Invasion, um, Art After Metaphysics, which is the text that we'll be using for the course, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, The Age of Catastrophe, uh, and a recent one about graphic novels. Um, so I'm a cultural critic, and that's the background that I have here. I've been doing this for years, uh, commenting on the intersection between art, popular culture, new media, and philosophy. Um, so that's my area of expertise and interest, and that's what I'll be bringing in here. Now, what I want to do in this course is to cover uh, the past five or six decades of contemporary art. Contemporary art is really daunting. Uh, art, generally speaking, is, is always challenging. It's always daunting, but particularly so with contemporary art, because a lot of people... Uh, when they first see it, uh, when they see something like Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes or uh, some, you know, Manzoni's cans of excrement or whatever, uh, they scratch their heads and they're not, they're, they're not sure whether a trick is being played on them or whether it's meant to be sincere uh, or what have you. But what I want to do is put into the hands of the student who takes this course the basic tools whereby he or she can then go into a museum and recognize works of contemporary art put them into a context of, I of ideas that makes sense uh, and allows them to appreciate it. So that's what I want to do, is to, is to give you the tools to do that in this course. And I want to start by looking at abstract expressionism, which for me signifies the shift of the art world from Paris to New York. And we'll look at the works of Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko, which uh, is where I see contemporary art uh, beginning. Not every uh, art theoretician does. Um, Arthur Danto, for example, sees it beginning with Andy Warhol, putting the Brillo box inside of the museum, and we'll look at that too. I want to look at Andy Warhol's cult of the celebrity and how he becomes the sort of priest of, of the celebrity, and we'll look at that. And we'll also look at uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, Andy Warhol was his idol, and Basquiat uh, moved graffiti art from the walls of uh, New York and brought them onto the inside of the museum, thereby instantly recreating them as works of art. So we'll look at the power of the museum and how installations work inside of museums uh, the power of the museum to, to transform the banal everyday object of the Brillo box, let's say, uh, from an object of consumer capital banality into something that, become, that functions now as a work of art, simply by putting it into the context of the museum. So for contemporary art, context is everything, and that's one of the pr basic parameters of it that we'll learn. I also want to move uh, from the New York world into the German world, and I want to look at the, uh, the objects, the strange and unusual objects of Joseph Boyce, who is one of the great practitioners of contemporary art, uh, and I want to look at how he takes banal objects like pianos and wraps them, insulates them in felt, and what that means I want to look at uh, how he takes something like as banal as a bathtub and in dialogue with Marcel Duchamp, who was the first to figure out these ready-mades, as they're called, banal objects that are just like found objects, um, who was the first to figure this out and how Boyce dialogues with Duchamp in that sense. Uh, so I want to look at Joseph Boyce and I also want to look at Odd Nedrum, who is um, often dismissed as an invalid practitioner of contemporary art and is dismissed as a mere kitsch artist. But um, because of his reappropriation of the style of the old masters of Caravaggio and Rembrandt uh, and Titian, he paints like them, but the content of his paintings is very contemporary. It's the, a lot of the imagery is derived from like, stuff like Mad Max films. It's brand new science fictional content, uh, but one of the main characteristics of contemporary art is precisely the quotation of old masters, the copying of old masters, uh, the excerptation and annotation of previous works of art that renders their status as works of art infinitely unfinished. It transforms all the great works of art of the great masters into works in progress, uh, continual works in progress. Uh, so we'll look at that, and I also want to move into looking at the works of Gerhard Richter and his process of what was called Vermalung, which was his process of taking photographs and transforming them into paintings, basically by overlaying them uh, and giving them uh, more complexity, more meaning in that, in that sense. So we'll look at Gerhard Richter, and we'll also look at Anselm Kiefer. Uh, we'll look at um, especially his construction at La Rabote. And I also want to look at Francis Bacon. I want to look at some of his paintings, and I want to look, Francis Bacon is very often considered to be a sort of atavistic modernist, and he is not. I believe that his work belongs firmly in the sphere of contemporary art, so we'll look at that as well. And I want to also look at uh, Damien Hirst. Francis Bacon was the great inspiration for Damien Hirst. And we'll look at his strange and very famous uh, vitrines, 
whereby he puts animals on the inside of glass cases. They're called vitrines. Uh, and we'll look at his work, uh, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, and we'll look at why it's called that. Um, and we'll look at the effect of putting animals inside of vitrines and how it deworlds them and creates them anew as art objects. So we'll look at that. And we'll also look at Yanis Kounelis and the Arte Povera movement, uh, which came out of Rome. And Yanis Kounelis uh, was a displaced Greek artist who recreates the Mediterranean world, reappropriates the space of the museum as a space for the generation of world islands on the inside of the museum. So we'll look at that, and we'll also look at the work of Christian Voltansky, who is one of uh, the great French artists. Uh, the French were a little bit late to understand contemporary art, as Boltanski himself admits. And uh, they came along rather late. They were slow to understand it, but they have produced one of its greatest artists in the work of Christian Boltanski. So we'll look at him as well. Uh, and we'll also look at a very exciting artist, one of my favorites, uh, the artist from who originally was from India and is now practicing in London, which is one of the great scenes now for contemporary art, Anish Kapoor. We'll look at his anti-objects that are so complex uh, and have so much uh, strangeness about them that, that, that they almost resist meaning. And we'll look at how and why those anti-objects function in the way that they do. And once the student has taken this course and has this basic conceptual vocabulary in place, uh, contemporary art will take on a whole new resonance and they, they, there will be a whole new understanding and appreciation. So this is going to be a very exciting course and we're going to have a lot of fun and I hope you'll join me and you'll take this course and you'll join me on our journey through contemporary art. We're going to have a lot of fun. You'll love it.